Hi, my beauties. My name is Dr. Stephanie Kappel, and I'm a board-certified fellowship-trained cosmetic dermatologist in Newport Beach, California. And today, I want to discuss a topic that I get asked frequently. It's one of the most requested treatments that I see in my office, and something that you guys have been asking me to do a video on for a while, and that is hooded upper eyelids, heavy upper eyelids, and different treatments and options that we have to open up the eyes or to tighten that upper eyelid skin or relieve any hooding that we have on our eyes. So before I move on, I ask that you like and subscribe and hit the notification bell because I drop new dermatologic information every Sunday and I always keep you guys in the know because there's always new lasers, new devices, new skin care active ingredients, new technologies that are always coming in this field of cosmetic dermatologists and I have an inside into the inner loop of it and want to be the liaison to kind of keep you guys in the know. So make sure that you subscribe, share this video with anyone who may find it helpful, and let's dive into talking about heavy upper eyelids and hooded upper eyes. So as a cosmetic dermatologist, I usually prefer minimally invasive procedures to tighten the skin or to achieve certain goals, whether it's a laser, an energy-based device, or an injectable, or a non-surgical option to address the issue. So in this case, for hooded eyes. So lasers, tightening devices, combination therapies, thread lifts, um, different things that we can do to relieve that. However, as a dermatologic surgeon, I also have surgery as an option for my patients. Although I don't usually recommend it out the gate, sometimes when certain skin ailments or skin problems go too far or too severe where minimally invasive or less invasive procedures are an answer, I can always have surgical options as an option as well. So I put on my surgeon cap or I keep on my dermatology cap. So I'm double board certified in both. So I like to have options and I will also discuss these various options with you as well. However, I always tend to lean on the side of minimally invasive procedures because I feel that they last longer and whenever you can induce your body's own regenerative processes to fix the problem, it always gives more natural looking results, longer lasting results, and if you do ever decide to have surgery, having these treatments under your belt will essentially have you'll have younger skin that your surgeon will be operating essentially on younger skin that's chocked full of more collagen, more elastin. And we always say as surgeons, it's like suturing wet tissue paper together versus suturing cardboard together. The results will last, they'll be more meaningful, and you'll just look better by having more collagen or more extracellular matrix proteins in the skin that we lose over time. So I just wanted to preface this video, even though I'm going to be talking about surgery at the end, I tend to lean towards more minimally invasive non-surgical options as well. So let's first discuss heavy upper eyelids and why they happen. First off, people may be born with heavier upper hooded eyelids. So either they're hooded, um, either anatomically you lack that little eyelid crease um, based on your ethnicity, your cultural background, your bone structure, your anatomy, this may vary. And for people who are born with it and who are my younger beauties, you know, we do have options for them to open up the eyes bigger and make them look more awake, alert and oriented and bright eyed and bushy tailed. Now, if you weren't born with hooded or heavy upper eyelids and you've noticed changes as you get older, as we gain wisdom and have birthdays, the upper eyelids can become heavier and hooded over time. And I can explain why and I can explain different treatments that we can do to kind of help reverse these changes or minimize those changes until maybe you get to a point where something a little bit more invasive, and I hate to use the word aggressive, but something more aggressive needs to be done, like an upper lip blepharoplasty or so forth. So starting with minimally invasive procedures. So one of the easiest ways we can open up the eyelid is by doing a little bit of Botox in the lateral inferior brow. So people mess this up all the time because sometimes patients, I have a long wait and I understand I, I understand it's hard and when you need it, you need it. And sometimes people will cheat on me and go to other injectors. And then they come back and they're like, Dr. Kappel, I have a drop lid, like, can you fix it? So that happens sometimes. And the reason why is because brow lift Botox always goes underneath the lateral brow. There's a muscle called the orbicularis oculi that goes around the eye and it's like a sphincter, a, a spherical shaped muscle, like a concentric muscle that tightens. So when you do a little drop of Botox, I'm talking like 1.5 to two units right here, it helps relieve that muscle from pulling in and it allows the frontalis muscle to go unopposed and open up the eye. I always like to get into the mechanisms of actions of different treatment 
modalities different for example neuromodulators how they work why is an injection point so specific and why does it specifically needed to be injected precisely into a muscle because the difference between here and here is like catastrophic so always go to an injector who knows what they're doing they reconstitute their botox the right way and they're injecting precisely where the muscle is going to take effect the best to give the best natural results and everybody's anatomy is a little bit different so you know i've seen on instagram like memorize this pdf of where the injection spots are. I like cringe when I see that. And when I teach other injectors how to inject, don't look at those forms. Just really know your anatomy well because everybody's musculature can vary a little bit. They used to say in medical school, not everybody reads the anatomy book. People have variant and aberrant anatomy. And if somebody is doing a brow lift Botox in the wrong area, you can like drop somebody's smile, make them look like they've had a stroke or a Bell's palsy. So it's really important. It's a little bit of Botox, but it can make a big difference, but it has to be injected precisely and in the right dose and in the right location as well. And it needs to be reconstituted the right way because if some offices are having like, oh, $6 a unit Botox or really cheap Botox, it's because they're watering the product down. And what happens is it doesn't last as long, but also more, you know, the more scary part of that is that if you water down your Botox, it can migrate out and hit out the levator muscles that are responsible for contracting and pulling up the corner of the mouth when you smile, then you look like post-ictal or you look like you've had like a stroke or something. So brow lift Botox can do a lot, but make sure that you go to somebody who knows what they're doing. So also doing a little bit right here by that mechanism of action can open up the eyes really naturally and really beautifully. Now the contraindication to that or the counter to that is not doing too much in the frontalis muscle. The frontalis muscle is a muscle that goes over the forehead. And remember how we talked about the orbicularis oculi muscle that goes around the eye? That's a circle, a kind of spherical muscle. And then you have the frontalis muscle here. Sometimes when people do too much Botox in the forehead, it can cause a heaviness or a droopiness of the upper eyelid. Also, when they do the glabellar lines, or what we call the 11 lines, the corrugator muscles are two thick muscles that run across the eyebrows right here, and there's a procerus muscle in the middle. That's why when we do glabellar Botox, we do a little bit here, here, and here. But if you notice in my videos, because I post on Instagram stories every day, like BTS, like treatments that I do in my office, when you do the glabellar Botox, you always wanna push that corrugator muscle up and out so it's more superficial, so you're not having the Botox migrate behind the palpebral, um, behind the upper eyelid and dropping and knocking out that muscle because sometimes if Botox is in place in the correct way, it can also make your eyes and eyelids look really, really heavy. So we treat heavy eyelids that are anatomically or from age with a little brow lift Botox, but also when people don't do Botox correctly and they do it too heavy in the frontalis, they're not pushing the corrugator muscles out enough or they're getting too low to the eyebrow, you're definitely gonna have heavy lids and hooded eyelids from Botox as an iatrogenic, which means from some type of treatment as opposed to just naturally occurring. So those are the two important topics I wanted to um, drive home with you guys for keeping the eyes nice, bright, open, and bushy-tailed. Okay, so we talked about Botox for opening up the eyes and making the eyes look bigger and to correct hooded upper eyelids. What are some of the other things that we can do? So fractal laser is a resurfacing laser. It's a non-ablative fractional resurfacing laser, which is amazing for so many different things. But when talking about crepey skin or loose eyelid skin or a lack of collagen in the eyelids, which cause crepiness and laxity, Fraxel is one of the best things that we can do to stimulate collagen. Now, I love Fraxel for under eye smoothing, for keeping that under eyelid smooth and nice and tight. For the upper eyelid, Fraxel can be a little bit more challenging because we have to put in an intraocular eye shield. Okay, what does that mean? An eye shield that goes inside the eye. If you follow me on Instagram, you guys see whenever I'm uh, lasering my patients, they usually have either a protective eyewear or glasses or little metal um, protective goggles, or I have even like a gauze over their eyes. When we're doing Fraxel, the upper eyelid, that upper eyelid is so or so thin that we have to protect the globe of the eye. So we have to put an eye shield inside the eye. We can't put it on the outside of the eye because then we won't be able to touch the skin with the laser handpiece. I always go like this when I'm lasering and I pretend like I'm lasering you guys as I, as I talk. But we put an eye shield inside the eye. It's not scary. It's not uncomfortable. If you wear contacts, it's kind of like having a big contact lens. We put some numbing drops in the eye. We lube it up. We put it under in the eye and then we gently do the fraxel laser over the upper eyelid skin. 
over time, over like two to four weeks later, it will help contract that skin. It'll help stimulate collagen. And anytime you have collagen in the skin, it makes the skin smoother and tighter. So a, the opposite is true. A loss of collagen as we get older will cause that laxity and that heaviness and that um, upper eyelid heaviness that we get as we get older. So doing a little bit of Fraxel over the upper eyelid is a really great way to keep that eyelid skin. It's a little bit harder because we have to put the eye shield inside the eye. Again, it's not uncomfortable and we do it all day, every day, and it's no big deal. Another combination treatment that we do with Fraxel sometimes is Thermage. Thermage combined with Fraxel like knocks it out of the park. I've had patients come back a week later for you know Botox or something else and after a week of doing Thermofrax on their eyes, it looks amazing. And um, the way we do that is we combine Fraxel with Thermage. Now it doesn't have to be done at the same treatment day, like at the same time. You can do it at the same time or say you have Fraxel one day and a month later you have Thermage. It's still called Thermofrax. But sometimes when you do it at the same time, it's like a one plus one equals three because you're having heat that's still in the skin from a thermage and then you hit it with the Fraxel and it just kind of augments each other. But I've noticed you get the same results whether you do it on the same day or a month later or two weeks later. I've done all these different tests myself to see if it makes a difference having it done at the same time. And I feel that from my before and afters and my results, it really doesn't. So moving on, when you do thermage, there's a different eyepiece that's needed than Fraxel. So we usually put in an eyepiece, do the thermage. Thermage doesn't hurt. It's very comfortable. Um, if you read online, there's different mixed reviews on Thermage. Eyelid Thermage definitely does not hurt. If it does hurt, somebody's doing something wrong and you should run out the door. It's not being done properly. But when it's done in the hands of a skilled provider who understands how the platform works, using the right handpiece, using the right protocol, and pushing the limits of the device safely and effectively, the results are untouchable. So we usually do a Thermage treatment, put the eye shield in, do the Thermage treatment. It's very comfortable. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Take the eye shield out, put another eye shield in because it has to be two different eye shields because one's radio frequency, energy-based device, the other one's collimated light and it needs a metal um, eye shield. So what we do is we do the Fraxel and then the downtime isn't bad at all. It's about maybe four to six days of a little bit of swelling, but your eyes aren't like swollen shut or anything like that. They just look a little bit puffy, like you had too much salt the night before. Sometimes people like it because especially when we do it under the eyes, it makes them look like they have under eye filler. But um, there may be a little erythema, which dermatologists call redness or like a pink discoloration of the skin that lasts about four to six days. But usually we'll have patients use a little bit of tinted sunscreen to hide it if they're gonna be on a Zoom call or if they're gonna be out and about, and it's really not that big of a deal. And then you start to notice the results about one to two months later, and then it keeps getting better. Remember, whenever you're inducing the skin to remodel itself, to make its own collagen, you're not passively injecting something, or you're not passively going into an OR and having a scalpel cut something out, stitch it up, and voila, it's done. It takes time. And Fraxel, Thermofrax, Thermage, these results take time because you're inducing your body's own regenerative processes to do the work and to give the results. And that's what makes it so next level. I always say, if you've ever had like a burn, like say you've burned your you know, arm on a stove or you've had a curling iron burn, you notice that like right, when it happens right away, it hurts like a bitch, but it doesn't look weird, right? But then like a week later, it'll get a little scabby and weird. And then like a month later, it could start to get like a textual regularity. And then two to three months later, it starts to get hyperpigmented. When you stimulate the skin, it's not like an overnight thing. It takes time. And so when we're doing these procedures like Thermage or Fraxel, energy-based devices and lasers, we're inducing the skin. We're giving it a stimulus to do the work. And that takes time and that's why results are so beautiful. It's kind of like going to the gym too. You don't like leave the gym and you're like, oh, I like I'm so buff and like you can see my muscles in definition already. You start to see it like two or three weeks later when you've gone a couple times and when you're getting the results of the hard work that you put into the gym weeks ago. So hopefully that makes sense. So we've talked about Botox or neuromodulators. We've talked about Thermage or energy-based devices. We've talked about Fraxel or other lasers. Now, when I say, I'm talking about the, the products that I have in my office. I have a Thermage, but it can be an therapy or another energy-based device. I personally like Thermage the best. I have the best results with it and the happiest patients and the clinical data and um, trials show point more to that device than others. When I say Fraxel, this could be a halo. It could be a fully ablative CO2. It could be a deep effect, scar effects, luminous. It could be any of the lasers that um, stimulate collagen, which most of them do, whether it's a CO2, an erbium, ablative, non-ablative. Um, what was I going to say? Where's my train of thought? Oh, and then also for neuromodulators, it doesn't have to be Botox. It could be, you know, Dysport or Zeeman, Javot, whatever one 
one that you like and that you or your provider recommends to you and don't be afraid to challenge your provider why are you recommending Javo and not Botox do you get like a special discount on it like don't be afraid to ask that because this is your face this is your money and this is your decision and and it's all elective and you're putting your hands into a provider to make the best decision for you and in, if it's not the best decision or if it's not the product that you want or if it's not a treatment that you've really researched and you've looked up and this provider doesn't provide it then it's good to have that conversation people do that to me all the time they'll fly in from all over the country to see me they've looked me up they've looked at my credentials they're in there seeing me for a reason and if I recommend one treatment and not another I love it when they ask me why and if it's a service that I can't provide or if it's a device or a laser I don't have in my office I can safely send them to someone a well respected colleague of mine who I know they'll be in good hands and that's part of you know that's valuable too just knowing who to send your patients to if it's something that you can't provide or say it's a surgery you don't perform or a laser you don't have so just you know don't be afraid to challenge your provider your injector your surgeon your dermatologist whoever it is that you're seeing on why they're recommending treatment a over treatment b and why don't you have it and if you don't can you send me to somebody who does if it's something that you really um really had your heart set on so i'm going to include this other treatment modality for hooded eyelids or opening the eyes although i don't recommend it because it wouldn't i don't feel that filler which is what i was going to talk about i don't feel like filler is the treatment of choice to open up the eyes or to treat hooded eyelids because obviously putting filler in the upper eyelids is just going to close out the eye and make it smaller um, the only caveat is that maybe sometimes doing temporal filler, usually we do um, Sculpture Voluma. I like Voluma better. I could do a whole video on why. I like Sculpture for other areas of the face and on, you know, booty augmentation, mid-face volume loss, Sculpture all day long. But right here, Voluma, look at how I get on a tangent so easily. But doing a little bit of filler here sometimes can open up the eyes a little bit, but I wouldn't do filler in the temples for that reason. Like if somebody said, Dr. Kappel, my eyes are hooded. I need to open up my eyes more. I wouldn't say, okay, let's treat it by doing some filler. Filler is not the answer for that treatment. And I feel like we're getting into an epidemic of filler fatigue and I feel that people are overusing fillers way too much. So energy-based devices, lasers, thread lifts, which is the next uh, modality that I'm going to talk about, and then surgery, which I'll talk about last because it's the most aggressive or invasive. So um, doing thread lifts, PDO threads are my favorite. I've been doing thread lifts since 2014 when I was a fellow and I've done all of them. And I re have recommended different you know, thread lift products as the time goes on because there's always constant competition is good in this industry because they keep one-upping each other with product development and better results. And so I'm always kind of changing it with the time. So right now, um, in 2002, November 2002, I know if people watch this video like three years later, it may be different um, because I do adapt with the times and with when better treatments come along, I always am open-minded and try everything. Um, but PDO threads are my favorite on today's date. And doing a little bit of threads um, into this area can help open up the eyes. So like Thermage, if you look up thread lifts and PDO threads, you're gonna see mixed reviews. You're gonna see surgeons saying bad things about threads because they just wanna take you in the operating room and operate on them. Or you're gonna be seeing bad reviews because most providers who own medical practices or medispas will have extenders who maybe aren't as highly trained doing thread lift procedures and they get the less desirable outcomes. Remember when you look at reviews online, you're looking at a whole mixture of different quality training providers performing these procedures. So if you see a less than desirable outcome, just take it with a grain of salt because in some states, if there's an esthetician that's able to do a thread lift procedure, you can't compare the results of someone who's like a surgeon who knows their anatomy well and has had 20 years of school performing these procedures. So there may be variation in that just because I know I'm gonna get questions on that. But doing thread lifts is great because you can hide it in the hairline and it's basically made out of polyolactic acid, which is a biostimulatory filler product. So you're injecting like a stimulant filler in, in and of itself. So you get two mechanisms of action. You get one that's pulling up, the two mechanisms of action. You get two mechanisms of action. One that is pulling up and one that is providing a slow depot of stimulatory filler that's going to stimulate your fibroblasts, which are the collagen producing cells in the skin to lift and tighten and pull from that mechanism. So you're stimulating collagen and you're mechanically, mechanically lifting up on that area. And that can give a really nice like fox eye. I don't like my brows. Actually, I don't do brow lift Botox like on myself because look how weird I look when it's up like that. I don't like it. I actually do Botox here to push it down. I don't like my eyelids too open 
as you can see, I got on another, another tangent, but um, a lot of um, surgeons too will do like the canthopexy or the fox eye lift, or they can do that with just threads my, themselves. And I perform thread lifts pretty regularly too, but if somebody wants a really longer lasting result, I'll defer to oculoplastics to kind of get that um, uh, fox eye look. Now, when it comes to blepharoplasty or upper eyelid surgery. I perform that in my office. I perform it under local anesthetic. I'm a dermatologic and Mohs surgeon by training as well, so I'm very comfortable doing this procedure. I don't have my patients out under general anesthesia. They're not intubated in an OR. Dermatologic surgeons are very used to having their patients awake, alert, and oriented during procedures. I mean, sometimes we, I would do Mohs micrographic surgery for skin cancers that are this big on the face and would have to do a huge flap and graft and my patients are up talking to me. They're under local anesthesia aesthetic, whereas sometimes general surgeons and plastic surgeons like their patients out intubated so they could just like have their way with them and not have the patient remember or be awake during the whole thing. I like my patients awake and oriented. Um, they're very comfortable. Patients, you know, we I perform the upper lip blepharoplasty in my patients. If you guys know Mary, my amazing office manager, she and I will be talking to you the whole time. Stephanie, my amazing nurse, will be assisting me and you'll be very comfortable. And the downtime is a lot less severe because there's a lot less trauma to the body because there's no general anesthesia or intubation or anything of that nature. It's just very clean, minimal local anesthetic needed. You'll have a little bit of swelling, maybe some bruising afterwards, but the bruising actually looks kind of cool. It looks like almost like reddish or purplish eyeliner. And you know, you look sometimes, sometimes people will have more bruising than others, but even in and of itself, the most the bruising will happen is just around in this area, and then I have my patients come back one week later, I zap them with some V-beam, and the, the bruising goes away. So it's very tolerable. You don't feel miserable after the procedure. I always have my patients so behave. I say no leg like, headstands, handstands, or jumping out of planes or anything like that, because you're gonna feel good, you're gonna feel fine, but that delicate eyelid skin, those wound edges have to be approximated, and you don't wanna like bust up when you're stitches. So I always tell patients, be really good, be on your best behavior, because that delicate eyelid skin has to to heal, um, but it's one of my favorite procedures to perform. I'll actually include some before and afters in this video, but blepharoplasty or upper eyelid surgery is for people who by non-surgical treatments alone can't get the results they want. If you've done thermofrax, if you've done brow lift with Botox, even if you did thread lifts and it doesn't give you long lasting results or as dramatic as results as you want, then usually people are candidates for upper eyelid blepharoplasty. So, Although I perform upper eyelid blepharoplasty, I do not perform lower eyelid blepharoplasty because I know some people are gonna ask me that. And that is because a lower eyelid blepharoplasty usually involves moving around the fat pad and going through the inside of the eye, which can be pretty traumatic for patients if you're not under general anesthesia or you're not more sedated. Upper eyelid is just really easy for the patient and for myself, so it doesn't require anything too gnarly, but for lower lid blepharoplasty, I don't perform that. I usually defer to my oculoplastics colleagues as well. So. Um, what else was I gonna say? Um, yeah, upper eyelid blepharoplasty, really easy to go through. The, the stitches, what we do is we um, remove the little excess skin uh, from the upper eyelid and we sew the skin, we sew the skin together in a scar that's hidden in the eyelid crease and barely noticeable. So nobody will know that you had it done. You'll look bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. The results last about 15 to 20 years and maybe even perhaps longer for most of my patients who I've been operating on. I've been practicing now for 15 years and patients who I did 15 years ago still look amazing. So I can't believe I've been practicing for that long but yes I have and patients who I did way back in the day are still looking good and I see them still regularly as patients as well um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention what else was I forgetting and one last question, which I like to inform you guys of because knowledge is power and half the reason why, well, the majority of the reason why I do this YouTube video, these videos is to educate you guys and to empower you with information so that you can select the best treatments for yourself. And when you do talk to your provider, say you get a second or third opinion, I always say get more than one opinion. And having knowledge to know what to ask your surgeon or your provider is really, really important. I wanna give you that gift um, so that you can get the best results and get the best treatments that are best and right for you. Um, the way that we are taught and trained um, to determine whether somebody is a brow lift candidate or a blepharoplasty candidate is by the position of the eyebrow on, on the orbital rim. So the orbital rim is this bony part of the skull. If you feel it, it's like you can see where your orbit is, where your eye socket is. And that bony prominence, if your eyebrow rests on the bony prominence of your skull, and your eyes are still closed out and hooded, that means that you just have extra skin that needs to be removed. That means that you're a blepharoplasty candidate. 
if your eyebrow rests below your orbital rim, then you're more of like a brow lift candidate. Then you have to have an endobrow surgery or tightening devices to shrink the forehead or pull up on the eyelid. So even if you, look, I can't even like move mine, um, which is good. I need to keep this tight, y'all. Okay, so when people are an endobrow candidate, their eyebrows rest below their orbital rim. So when you go to see your provider or your plastic surgeon, your dermatologist, your dermatologic surgeon, and they're like feeling on your eyebrows, that's what we're doing. We're trying to decide, is this an endobrow? So for me, if this is an endobrow patient, I'm gonna to refer to my oculoplastics or my uh, plastic surgeon colleagues. If it's an upper blepharoplasty candidate, then I talk to them about blepharoplasty as a surgical option. And then the other thing I wanted to, to note um, is that when you're getting forehead Botox, make sure that they're not dousing your forehead with so much Botox because that's what makes those upper eyelids heavy. But the cool thing about having an upper eyelid surgery is that you could put 20 units of Botox and get that smooth, glassy forehead that you haven't been able to have because it's always at the expense of your eyelids being too, too heavy. So that's one of my patient's favorite things is like, not only do they look amazing after their blepharoplasty and the results show pretty much right away, um, they're able to like have these smooth, glassy foreheads because you can load it up with Botox and you can have a smooth forehead, these big, bright, open eyes and it's just a win-win situation all around. So I hope this answers your questions. Drop a comment in the comment section if I didn't um, get to something that you wanted to hear in this video and more importantly drop a comment in the comment section on future videos that you want me to do because I want to put out content that you guys are interested in and um, that I you know can address for you and answer any questions that you have on. So I love you guys. Thank you so much for following. Share this um, channel with anyone who may find it useful or any screen nerds out there who like to dork out on science and aesthetics as much as we do. I love you guys for keeping the eyelids open and awake and alert and not weird looking.